Welcome to Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I'm James Shore. Every week we look at, uh, we choose a software development technique or skill, come up with a challenge related to that skill, and then solve it live on stream. And this week, it's how to add a feature cleanly. And this sounds really basic, but it's actually more complicated than you might think. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with the code for today, you can download it from github.com, uh, github.com slash James Shore slash live stream. Check out this tag, 2020-06-30. As usual, your comments and questions are very, very welcome. Just go ahead and add them to the chat. So today's topic, how to add a feature cleanly. Uh, this sounds really straightforward, but when we're working with code that we're unfamiliar with, which is really often in a professional development environment, uh, the code's often kind of a black box. So the question is, how do we figure out where to add the new feature that we're gonna want? I do a lot of consulting and I work with a lot of teams who have code bases of, of varying quality. And one of the things that I see as a very common trend uh, that separates the better code bases from the less better code bases <laughs> is how much attention people put on understanding the design of the code when they're adding a new feature. It's really tempting. I mean, it takes long enough to just get to the point where you're, where you understand how the code works and where a feature lives. Uh, that usually when you figure that out, you just want to go in and find that code and make the minimal change necessary to get your new behavior working, and then you call it good. But that leads to technical debt. That's adding a feature, but it's not adding it cleanly. So the question is, how do we take this black box, understand where the feature we need to live, uh, where the feature we need to add lives, and then improve the design so that our new feature fits in really cleanly? That's the challenge. Specifically, today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be continuing our, uh, we're gonna be using the Road 13 service we built in previous episodes. Uh, you can find those down here, jameshore.com slash blog slash lunch and learn. You don't have to have seen those episodes. In fact, in some ways it's better if you haven't. But uh, if you have seen them, then some of this will be familiar to you. Uh, what we have here is we have a Road 13 service that takes uh, Road 13 text and transforms it using JSON. Uh, Uncle Scientist, great to see you, glad you could make it. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna take the, this, we've got the service that takes text and uh, transforms it using Rote 13, uh, which is the little spoiler hiding thing. And right now that application takes a content type, application JSON, uh, and if you don't get that exact content type, then it will return a bad request back to you. But the problem is, is that the specification for content type is more than just the exact string application JSON. So right now, if you you can pass in a legal content type and have the service fail. Now this isn't a huge problem because in practice people don't usually pass in other kind of content types and we also specify what the content type should be, but it's it's kind of annoying. It's it's not a great design, it's not great implementation. So we want to add the feature so to, we want to modify the feature so that we support any valid content type. Citate Sir, uh, thank you very much for joining. So that is the challenge. We're going to be taking the Road 13 service that we wrote in previous episodes and we're going to be enhancing the content type handling so that we can handle any legal content type. The question, again, is how do we do that cleanly? I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. While you're thinking about it, I want to remind you that uh, the show is made possible by people like you who bring me in to do coaching and training. Uh, often organizations want more agility, uh, more business agility, and, but don't have the technical capacity to give them the agility they want. And so they bring me in to provide anything from test-driven development training and coaching all the way up to process design and uh, how to have multiple teams working together. Uh, Sinaligma, thank you for joining. Welcome. Uh, so if you'd like to be one of these above, part of this above average group of people, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com. Very happy to have a conversation with you about what your team is doing and how I might be able to help. Uh, you can find me on the web at jameshore.com. And I'm also very happy to get tweets from anybody for any reason at jameshore. Uh, just uh, send it my way.
Okay, let's go ahead and get back to the challenge. Again, what we're going to be doing here is modifying our Rote 13 service so that it supports any legal content type. How can we do that cleanly? Well, I've got a simple seven-step process, and this looks worse than it really is. Um, Hey, Santa Logma, know that I have done Java development. Yes, I do Java, I do C Sharp. Uh, this stream, however, is going to be in Node.js uh, because, well, I had to choose a language. So uh, how to add a feature? Well, first, you need to understand the feature that you're adding. Uh, second, uh, skim the design. So understand the feature and then understand the design of the code that you're modifying. Once you've done that, you can find the current implementation, where the current behavior lives and the implementation of that current behavior. And then you're going to want to find the file whose responsibilities are best suited to the new behavior. And that's not always the current implementation. And this is part of how we do things cleanly, is we want to not just find where the code is implemented now, but also think where is the best place for this new behavior to be gone, to be uh, to live. And then we're going to decide how those two things connect. How does the current implementation connect to where the best place uh, is? We're going to decide what to change, and then we're going to implement the change. This is what we're going to be doing in just a moment. Uh, before that, though, let me show you what we've got going on here. Uh, if you'd like to follow along, again, you can check out the code from github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. Uh, the tag is 2020-06-30. At the end of the stream, I'll be uh, committing the, the finished results and tagging it 2020-06-30-end. All the code here is written in Node.js, but this isn't what I'm teaching you and what's showing you today isn't really about Node.js specifically. It will work with any mainstream language. If you'd like to follow along, you'll need a copy of Node.js installed, and then you can build the uh, code and run the tests by running build.sh or just build on Windows. Uh, that will lint everything for you, and it will run the tests. Let's go ahead and let that go. And then if you want to only build and test things that have changed, you can use the quick option like this. Uh, and finally, uh, if you want to have the tests run automatically whenever you make a change, uh, use the watch script. And that will also make a little sound when the test pass or fail. Now to run the uh, code, you can use run.sh or just run on Windows. Uh, so run.sh like that. So that's how the code works. Again, you can follow along by checking or downloading the code from github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. So let's go ahead and take a look. First thing that we're going to do here is understand the feature. And when you're adding a feature and trying to understand the feature, you're going to ask yourself, of course, what is this? How is this different than what the code is doing today? But also, what parts of what's what are we changing is important and what parts can we safely ignore? You don't want to boil the ocean when you're adding a new feature. You don't want to handle every possible case. You only want to handle the parts that are important for your application. So looking at our actual code here, let's look and see, let's, let's look at how that feature works. So we've got, I'm going to run it over here. We've got our server running on the left. And over here on the right, I'm going to actually make the request to the Route 13 server. I'm using a little library called HTTPy, and that allows me post to port 5000, the Route 13 transform endpoint, and I'm going to pass in the content type header with the value application JSON, and then I'm going to pass in some JSON with the value text, equal, the field text, which is going to equal hello. And I'm going to tell it to show me the I'm going to give the verbose option, which will show us what it sends and what we get back. So what you're going to see here is we're sending, there's our content type, application JSON, we're sending text hello, we're getting back transformed URYYB, which is the Rote 13 encoding of hello. So that's how the code works today. Now, the problem here is that application, the content type is, is there are many ways for this to be legal. One of them is that we could pass in, it's case insensitive, so we could pass in uppercase application JSON and it should still work. But right now it doesn't. Uh, you can see we're getting an invalid content type header. Similarly, we could pass in a uh, 
property called char set, which you see like text HTML char set equals UTF-8, we could pass that in. That's legal. But if we pass that in, we get invalid content type header. So this is the feature that we're adding. This is what we actually want to change. So that's what's different about the code. We want to make it so that it supports all legal application JSONs. Now, which, which part of this is important and how exactly is this feature going to work? Well, to understand this, I had to look at the RFCs, the HTTP RFCs. And don't worry, I'm not gonna read through them with you. Here's the important parts. RFC 7231 specifies how HTTP requests and responses work. And in that RFC, it tells us the format of the content type header. Content type header has to be a media type uh, parameter, which you can see there at the top. It consists of a type slash subtype, in this case, application slash JSON, and then any number of parameters, which are separated by semicolons and have optional white space. That's OWS, it stands for optional white space. So we can have application slash JSON, any amount of white space, then a semicolon, any amount of white space, and then a parameter. And then again, white space, semicolon, white space, parameter, et cetera, et cetera. The star parentheses means we're gonna repeat this zero or more times. The parameter is equal to token equals token or token equals string. Token is just a word like char set or UTF-8. String is the same thing, only it's got quotes around it. So a parameter can be anything like char set equals UTF-8 or it could be foo equals bar or anything else. Uh, the RFC also says that the type, the subtype, and specifically the char set parameter are all case insensitive. So that's how the content type header works. Again, what we need to do in order to add a feature, we need to understand the feature that we're adding. So that's why we're getting into this. Now, RFC 8259 talks about application JSON specifically. When I went into this last week, you may have heard me talking about this. When I went into this, I th assumed that application JSON needed the char set parameter to specify the encoding. But actually, RFC 8259 says that JSON text must be encoded using UTF-8. You can, the, the char set parameter is defined, and if you use it, it has no effect. So this is useful for us. Now we know what's important and what we, what we can safely ignore. What's important is that the application JSON part is case insensitive. What's important is that we can have white space. What isn't important is the parameters because there's no char set parameter uh, defined for this and no other parameters are defined either. So even though you can have as many parameters as you want, we can just safely ignore them and that's fine. So that's the feature we're gonna add. We're gonna have case insensitivity, we're gonna have white space, and we're gonna have parameters, but we're gonna ignore them. So that's step, that's our first step, understand the feature. Now we're gonna skim the existing design. We have to understand the design well enough to figure out how the code we're gonna add fits in. I do a lot of consulting, I join a lot of teams who have very large code bases, and so I've come up with some techniques for quickly understanding code that uh, gets you up to speed really quickly. And the key here is skimming. Uh, what I do is whenever I come into a new code base, I just skim through and I look at all the folder and file names. I don't even open the files and folders most of the time. I just look at the names. And even though you might have a mixed set of opinions about other people's code, uh, the fact is, is that most code most programmers care about good design, and so they put some attention to their names, particularly their file and folder names. And so you can usually make an educated guess based on those names about what those files are responsible for. You're not always gonna be right. Sometimes designs drift over time, especially if people haven't been big, careful about adding their new features, but it will give you a, sort of an educated guess. So what I do is I just go through, I look at all the file names, I make a guess for each one, just a one sentence guess about what each file is responsible for. Uh, sometimes if it's not clear, or if I wanna get a better uh, understanding, I'll open the files and look at just the top level method names or class names or function names. And I'll particularly do this for the largest files. So I might do a quick search, say what are the biggest files in this code base or the ones that look like they're the most important. And I'll look inside the top four of those. But typically, uh, 
just a few of those, and mostly I'm just looking at the folder and file names. That's gonna be a really good way of giving you a quick understanding of how the design works. Not necessarily totally accurate, but it'll give you a quick overview. So let's go ahead and do that. So here in our code base, this is our road 13 code base. Uh, this, all the source code is in source, and that's documented in the readme. And now we want to look at this and see which of these, what are, what's the quick one line responsibility for one sentence responsibility for each of these files. Now, I admittedly, I wrote this code, so I know what everything work, how everything works, and I just wrote it in the last four weeks. But I'm going to try to channel my inner my inner ignorance, and, <laughs> which I've got plenty of, and uh, pretend I don't know what this code is. So I'll typically start at the top level. Uh, here we've got Route 13 server and run. I would typically expect that run starts the application. And let's just take a quick look. Yeah, there's one line of code in here. This is the entry point. We can ignore it. Route 13 server, I would guess that's probably the top level um, uh, Top level traffic cop sort of makes everything, hooks everything up, but I would guess it doesn't do a lot. That would be my, my first guess. Um, infrastructure, that's probably just lots of gory details, I would guess. Logic, I would expect the application logic to be there. The root 13 to actually happen in that folder. Routing, that's the mother load. That is probably most related to the stuff we're trying to do here because we're doing content type stuff that's very related to routing. Uh, util, there's always a util, and it's never interesting, <laughs> or almost never interesting. We can probably safely ignore that. Okay, let's look into these in more detail. Inside of infrastructure, uh, we notice a couple of things. What I, One of them is, is that whoever wrote this is really weird, <laughs> and they mix their tests in with their production code. And you might not like that, you know? And as you're looking at existing code, whenever you're looking at other people's code, there's you can look at it in one of two ways. You can say, what's all the stuff in here that I hate? Like the fact that whoever wrote this, hi, uh, whoever wrote this has got this really weird opinion about putting their tests alongside their production code. You can find the stuff you can hate, or you can find the stuff that's beautiful. And the trick with modifying existing code cleanly is to not, rather than focus on the stuff that you hate, find the beauty. Find Everybody who creates code had some sort of design in mind. If they're really junior, it may not have been a great design, but they still had some design in mind. Your job as somebody who's coming in and modifying this code is to find the beautiful design they had in mind and make it better. So if you focus on the stuff you hate, you're only gonna be make yourself miserable. Find the beauty in the code. So we're gonna skip past all this weird test stuff and we're gonna look at these three files. Uh, we've got command line, which I would presume is to do with command line processing in some way. And um, HTTP request, uh, Charlie Pancake says, uh, I should offer my consulting time to whoever wrote this code. Yeah, they're, they obviously need help, right? <laughs> so command line, command line processing, uh, HTTP request. I would assume that has to do with the request and the server. Uh, we've already got a server, wrote 13 server. So my guess is that this is probably like the guts of the serving. Okay, let's see what's next. Logic. Uh, hey, I was right. Surprise, surprise. The Road 13 logic is in the logic folder. At least that'd be my best guess. And then finally, routing. This is where we're thinking the most interesting stuff might be. In here, we've got Road 13 response, and we've got Road 13 router. Road 13 router, that's probably the top level routing. That's the, again, that's probably the jackpot. I'm going to want to look at that. Response I'm not so sure what that is. That's kind of weird. I might expect the response to be in the infrastructure code, like the request is, but no, we've got something here. So let's go ahead and dig into that and look at just the top level file name, see what we've got. We've got okay, not found, method not allowed, bad. Okay, so this is obviously the specific responses. Okay. So that's uh, that. And then util, we expect to be boring, assert, ensure, test helper type. Yep, that's boring. So we'll skip on past that. So that is skimming the existing design. We're gonna look at the folder names and file names, and we're just gonna make an educated guess about the one sentence responsibilities. And here they are. This is everything that we just uh, went through. So step three, now we need to find the implementation of the current code. 
I always start out, uh, I've got this list of file responsibilities. And sometimes if the code base is really big, I'll just sort of narrow in on one set of folders that I think are gonna be most interesting and start with that. So I've got this list of file responsibilities. I'm gonna look at that and make an educated guess about which file is most likely to have the implementation that we care about. And then I'll read the code and the test for that file and see if I'm right. And if it looks like I am, I'll actually change the code and see if the behavior changes. And if it does, then yeah, I've, I've gotten it. So let's come back to our list of files. Which of these is most likely to be responsible for handling the context type header or the content type header? It's probably not run. Uh, it's probably not the top level server. Although if it's the, the design's a little wonky, it could be. Uh, almost certainly not the command line could be in the HTTP request. Uh, that's that's a pretty good guess because that's where all of our HTTP request stuff is, we think. Uh, it could be in the HTTP server depending on how the requests are handled. Maybe the responsibilities, some of the you know early re responsibilities around request handling, that could be in the, the server handling code. Uh, it's probably not in our business logic if this is well designed. Uh, it's probably not in our response code. Uh, could be in the router. Uh, we think that's the main traffic cop. And I think that's where I'm gonna start. It's either an HTTP request or the router. But since the router's the traffic cop, um, I'm gonna start out and look at that first. So we're gonna read that, we're gonna take that file and read the code and tests and see if that's where things have landed. So let's come into our router and we're gonna open up our tests and our production code. And if we look at our tests, we see happy path transforms requests. Again, we're just gonna skim here. We're just gonna look through the test names. Uh, returns not found when URL is incorrect. Returns method not allowed when method isn't post. Returns bad requests and content type header isn't JSON. Jackpot, that's it. Okay, so this is testing it, so that's a good sign. Now let's look at the code. Well, the code's nice and small. That's nice, less to read. Uh, We've got route async, URL, method, headers. There is something that looks really promising. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, something else I might do in a large code base is I see that right here we've got application JSON. I might actually just do a cross code base search for application JSON to confirm my gut feel here. Is there any other place that is looking at this? So I'm gonna search for application JSON, and we see that, uh, but hold on, let's only look in the source directory. Okay, find and path, application JSON. Okay, we've got it in our response. Presumably that has to do with sending the response, and we've got it in the router. Okay, this is a good sign. So this is probably the spot. Now to confirm this, what I can do is I can actually make a change. So let's say that rather than looking for application JSON, we're gonna look for application XXX. And I'll restart the server. And if this works the way I think it does, then now application JSON will say invalid content type header. And application XXX will say will work. And it does. Excellent. So we know we found at least one spot. Now in in design code with design that's a little on the rougher side, sometimes you've got duplication. So it does make sense to do a file search and sort of search through, um, maybe if, try different cases. But this is a this is probably good enough um, for us. Uh, GE Herbert asks, uh, why not find files for content type? You know that's a really good idea. I could have done that. Uh, I just didn't think of it. Uh, so instead of searching for application slash JSON, I could have searched for content type. Uh, in this case though, because uh, I wrote this code and I rehearsed this uh, today's live stream, this is, I'm pretty sure this is, I know this, this is the spot. So we found it. I'm gonna go ahead and reset the repo, uh, get rid of the changes that we just made. And now we're ready to go on to our next step. So we found the implementation. Now what we need to do is find the place that has the responsibilities 
uh, associated with this. So this isn't necessarily the code that influenced the code, the behavior now. Uh, often when you're looking at existing code, the design drifts over time and people don't necessarily take the time and effort that we're taking today to figure out how the design is supposed to work. So they'll just hack in their changes, uh, their code, wherever it's most convenient. Also, as you add new features, the best, you know, the really high quality, simple design, that's going to change. So what might have been right and perfect for the features we had last week isn't necessarily what's right and perfect for the features we have today. So the question is, which code is best suited for this new responsibility, for this, for having responsibility for the behavior that we're about to add. Um, so we're gonna, again, start with that review of our file responsibilities, and we're gonna think about information flows. Who is responsible for the data that we're dealing with here? You want your behavior to be close to your data. You want it to be cohesive. If you can do that, you're generally gonna end up with better quality designs than if you don't. If you only do that one thing, you're going to, it's gonna help your design. So object-oriented programming is nice because it allows you to put your behavior and data right next to each other. Not everybody uses objects like that, so you may not find that in your designs, but that's what we wanna look for. We wanna look for the data, and we want to look for behavior that's gonna be next to that data. Even if you're not using object-oriented programming, you're still gonna have functions that operate on particular sets of data, and you wanna keep those functions grouped together so that you can find them easily. So once we have a sense, a guess about where those responsibilities live, then we'll look at the code and confirm. And sometimes uh, if the code's fairly big, uh, what seems like the right spot for the responsibility will actually have a bunch of dependencies that deal with actually solving those responsibilities. And so the right place might be in one of those dependencies. For us, uh, let's look at this. Who is supposed to be responsible for this code? If we look at our existing code, we can see that we're pulling the content type out of the request and then we're checking it. That's kind of a uh, smell. That's a that's a potential design flaw. And when we look at our responsibilities, we see that anything related to the HTTP request goes in the HTTP request, or at least that's what we think it does. And that was one of our guesses about where this content type checking might be. So that tells us that maybe the right spot for these responsibilities is not the router, but actually the request. Because in our code, we're pulling the data out of the router and we're operating on it that means that we're taking responsibility away from the router or from the request. So let's go ahead and take a look at the request and see if we're right. So I'm gonna go back to our code and I'm gonna open up our request. And let's see what we got. In the test, we're saying that we provide the URL, the method, the headers, uh, we have immutable headers, so yeah, we're obviously doing some stuff around headers. We provide the body, we fail fast, the body's read twice. Uh, in the actual production code, and then there was some stuff about nullable infrastructure, which I'm going to skip today. Um, in the infrastructure, we create, we have some constructor stuff. Uh, we've got URL method headers and read body async. So this this code right now, it's obviously, the responsibility of this code is to be about sort of a, a dumb data structure. It's just giving us access to the data. And then our router is making decisions based on that. The question is, is, is that the best design? Or does it make sense for us to actually have responsibilities related to understanding the content type in the request? Well, I don't know. It's, it's actually kind of an open question. Let's see what our next step is. So next, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna decide how the current implementation connects to the file that should have responsibility. Well, we haven't actually decided which file should have responsibility. I'm leaning towards putting in the request because anytime you take data out of something and then operate on it, that tells you that it's usually a design smell. Um, so if we say that the request is where the responsibility for this new behavior should live, how does the current implementation connect to that responsibility? Well, if we look at it, uh, it's actually really straightforward. We just pull, we, we have access to the request, so it connects directly to the request. That makes it easy. However, in some cases, what's gonna happen is the place that's really the right place for the new behavior to live 
is not going to be connected to where the behavior lives now at all. And now you have a tough choice to make. Is this a design flaw? And if it is, do we want to fix it? And sometimes the answer is no, it's not a design flaw or no, or yes, it is a design flaw, but we don't have time to fix it today. And if that, that's the case, then you go back and you say, well, what's the next best response place for this responsibility to leave? And, and you do it again until you find sort of the right trade-off between amount of work and amount of design changes and live the behavior living in the right spot. So I think for us, making the router use the request, no problem, if that's what we want to do, which I think it might be. Now, step six, decide how we're going to change it. How are we going to change the current implementation to use to have the new behavior? And how are we going to add the new behavior to the code that should have responsibility for it? And programming by intention, which I've discussed in previous weeks, can help here. Programming by intention, once again, is writing pseudocode, writing your code as if all the functions, all the helper functions you want already existed. It's basically pseudocode. So let's go ahead and try that here. I think I want to have the responsibility live in the request, but if we did, what would that look like? Here's how it works right now. We say, look at the request headers, take out the content type header, and check to see if it's application JSON. If we were to keep all those responsibilities here, we'd have some sort of check that said, parse the header and then check the media type. But that's now making this code more complicated, and that's not really tightly related to the responsibilities of this code. This code is responsible for traffic copying. It's checking the URL, the method, the headers, the JSON, um, and then it's actually making the transformation. Lots of stuff going on here. I don't want to add more complexity around parsing related to one specific header. So that's definitely moving me in the direction of the request is the right spot to put this. Okay, so if we put in the request, what would that look like? We'd say if request, um, now we could say if request, we could say request dot parse content type, and then we can get say the media type and the parameters, uh, or maybe media type and parameters like this. And then we could say if request dot media type equals application JSON, but that's still, kind of ugly. What if we made, when I say something should have responsibility, I want it to do all the work. So what if we did that? What if we said something along the lines of, if request, what are we doing here? We're saying, does it have the right media type? So if the request does not have the media type we're expecting, then we should return the invalid content type. What if we did it like that? I think that could be a really interesting design. Now it's putting all the responsibility into the HTTP request. It actually makes our router simpler and easier to understand, not more complicated. That's a good sign. I think this might be a winner. Uh, the only thing that bugs me here is that I'm talking about media type, but I called it has content type. I could say has media type, but now it's not obvious that we're talking about content type. We could make a new object called content type, request.contenttype.hasmedia type, or has media, but now it's getting really complicated, and I don't want to make our code too complicated. I don't want it to be ravioli. So let's start with has content type and see where that takes us. Now, uh, Uncle Scientist has been making some content comments, so uh, they say, uh, but the road 13 router should still validate its JSON. The request code shouldn't be responsible for determining if it's JSON. Um, I, I completely agree with that, Uncle Scientist, and it sounds like you, you see where we went with that eventually. Um, yeah, I wouldn't put the JSON in the request. I think the request, that would be, that would be going too far in terms of responsibilities. It's definitely the router's responsibility to figure out what to do with the request. Uh, it's the request responsibility to give us information about it. And I like the way this works out where we're having the request tell us if it has the content type, but not make any action on it. That to me feels like the right distribution of responsibilities. This is design. Figuring out who has which responsibilities and how we're gonna divide those responsibilities, that's design. If you don't do that, then you have one giant file that does everything. And in some ways that's easier to understand and work with when your systems are small. But as they get bigger, you have to start dividing up and now things don't connect to each other. Uh, and so figuring out how to make them connect cleanly, that's design and that's all about figuring out who's responsible for what and how they're gonna to talk to each other. 
So I think we've got this figured out. We know what we're going to change. Uh, Pellet, great to see you. Uh, Pellet says, uh, do you have any suggestions for finding a good balance between this versus making a separate object that validates has appropriate media type? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so coming back to this, we could have said, for example, uh, if request, if not request dot media type or content type dot, for example, has appropriate media type, or I'd probably just say has media type. We could do something like this. And I, I like this. I think this is really cool looking. Um, the question, the problem is, is the opposite of spaghetti code is ravioli code. And ravioli code is when you've taken your application, you've split it up into so many tiny little pieces that now you can't find anything. Or if you do that sort of skim of files that I was talking about, uh, it's, you're going to go on forever. So where's the balance? Uh, how do you balance between splitting this out, which is really cool, or doing this, which is maybe a little less uh, understandable? Uh, Pellet says, uh, I've worked in some code bases where there would be a dedicated class to handle the logic for that. Yeah, you might do that. The decision about when you're going to split it out or not is very much a matter of taste. For me, it all comes, my decision about when to split is really, really straightforward. Rule one, keep everything together. It's easy to understand. Rule two, big code is hard to understand. Split big code apart. That's it. I keep it together until the code's gotten too big, or if I've got really different things happening in the same file. How big is too big? Um, more than a couple of screens is too big. One screen is fine. Two screens, probably okay. Uh, more than that, too much code. So I keep my classes and my files down to 100 to 200 lines at most. And if it's more than that, then I start looking at splitting it out. But I'm still probably, in most cases, I'm going to keep the high-level interface as simple as I can. I don't want to, as I split things out, I'm going to try to hide that behind the higher-level thing I split from. Uh, so that's the approach I take. Um, uh, Pellet says, yeah, if you split out for everything, then you have a ton of them. Um, yeah, and uh, Pellet, uh, let me pull this up. I this is this is totally legit. You see, you see people writing code like this. They think it's good design, and it can be good design if you've got a really good pro big problem. But when your code's small, and the problem is simple, keep your code small and simple. Uh, so this idea of concrete media type dot uh, dot JSON validator dot is valid. Yeah, it's uh, it, keep your code simple if you possibly can. I want to keep my code simple first, and but also readable. And the tension there is between simple and readability. In our case, I think that the right balance between simple and readable is to keep it inside of the HTTP request. Over time, as we add more features, we can always pull stuff out. Refactoring means that you never have to say you're sorry. You can start out with something simple today. You don't have to anticipate the future. And in the future, if it gets more complicated, then yeah, go ahead and pull it out then. So this is our design right here, if request has content type. So what are we going to do with this? Well, we've decided what to change. Now we're actually going to implement it. And when you're implementing it, now for us, it's fairly straightforward because this isn't a big code base. But when you're implementing a bigger change in a bigger code base, think of your code as a graph of dependencies. Uh, you're, you've got sort of the place where things are implemented now, and then it depends on some stuff that you want to change, and then some, those depend on some more stuff you want to change. Then you get down to sort of the leaves where they don't depend on anything more. more. It's going to be easiest to make your changes if you start at the leaves rather than at the root. So don't start with the existing behavior. Start with the, the stuff that you want to change down in the bottom, because you can change those in isolation and not have anybody use your new code yet and then work your way up, wiring each higher node to the nodes underneath. And then when you get to the top, you have all this new code that's ready. You could even integrate it. You can even ship it, but nobody's using it yet. And that's what you want. You want to be able to continually be able to continue to integrate. You want to be able to do continuous integration, also called trunk-based development these days. You want to be able to ship your code and not worry about whether the new code that's not done is going to break anything. So by starting with a leaf nose, you can sort of work your way up, keep on all your code working exactly the way it is today. And then the very, when everything's done, then you change the old behavior to use the new code. And it's like an atomic database transaction. You just make the change, flip a switch, should be pretty easy. And then poof, 
your new behaviors in place and you can turn it on. Uh, you can also use something like a feature flag, but it's actually, if you don't need a feature flag, it's easiest to use this sort of build up from the bottom, not turning it on until you're ready, ready to it. I think Martin Fowler calls this a keystone UI, although it's not restricted to just UIs. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, looking at our code, we have our root 13 router. What we're going to do is we're going to change this piece right here. Uh, but that's our programming by intention. We're not ready to do that just yet. Instead, what we're going to do, our leaf node here is the dependency is HTTP request. And that's what we're going to change first. We're going to add the new feature here, not wired up, and we'll have everything work in, until we're ready to wire it up. So let me uh, run the tests, make sure everything's still working here. Okay. So again, rather than starting in the router, we're going to start at our leaf node, which is our HTTP request. And the specific thing that we want to do, we want to implement has content type. So of course, when you're needing, when you, when it's time to actually get into the code, you got to read it, understand it. Uh, I usually start with the tests. So we're seeing that request provides a URL, provides a method, provides headers, has immutable headers, provides body, uh, fails fast if the body is read twice. We've got some stuff about nullability. I think we can leave the nullability alone. Uh, the new test that I'm going to add about the content type, I'm not sure where I want to fit this in. It doesn't really feel related to what we have here. This is all about the raw data. And in fact, I'm going to do that. Whenever you're changing code, leave it a little better than you find it, found it. So I'm going to change this to say that this is all about raw data. So I'll group this. And then the new thing we're adding, this is going to be about the cooked content type header. And what do we want to do here? Well, we're going to add this new method called, what's it called? Has content type. So, and what do we want that to do? Well, if you remember from uh, our very first Lunch and Learn, which again, you can find uh, right down here, mm -hmm. jamesshore.com slash blog slash Lunch and Learn. We talk about incremental TDD and eating the onion from the inside out. That's how we're going to implement this. We're going to build it from the inside out, starting with the simple happy path case, happy path being the, the case with no unusual behavior, and sort of add layer onto that uh, from the simplest case to the more complicated case. So what's the simplest case for our has content type? Well, in a nice case, I think it's what we've got already, just a simple string comparison. So it checks if uh, expected media type matches content type header. Now to implement this, we're going to need to have a request. We, if we look at our existing test, we've got this way of creating a request. That looks overly complicated. That is creating a server and starting it. No, we don't want to do that. Uh, but we also have the ability to create null requests. And since nothing we're doing here is really server specific, I think we can just use a null request. So I'm going to do that. We're going to take our request. We're going to create a null request, which uh, the pattern there, of course, is just a request that uh, a piece of infrastructure that doesn't talk to the real server or real outside world. And that request is going to take some headers. And the header that we're going to want to have here is the content type header. And let's say application JSON. And then so once we have the request, we can say that the we expect the request, and again, what's it called? has content type application JSON, that should be true. Now I could do something like assert is true, but I actually find that my tests read more clearly when I do assert equal on the result of a function call. So that's how I tend to do it. Uh, Alverse says, uh, just want to say that this is great and very interesting content. I will check for the early episodes for sure. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Alverse. I really appreciate you saying that. So. This should work, but it's not going to because, well, 
it doesn't exist <laughs> as content type is not a function. Uh, so let's add it. I think I'm going to put it right here next to the headers. That seems like a good spot for it. And we're going to expect a particular media type. And I do do uh, runtime type checking, so I'm just going to go ahead and add that. I don't test it. So we expect that we're going to get a string argument. And we can just hard code this to be true for now. So red, green, refactor, mm -hmm. we're going to start out, want to keep things really small and simple and straightforward. Of course, that code's obviously not good enough, so we need to say that uh, media type doesn't match. Checks that media type doesn't match. And we're going to do the same thing, except now we're going to want this to be false. And we'll say that this is, well, let's say text plain, just for the point sake of example. Now, we expected that to be false, but it's returning true. Why? Well, we hard-coded it. <laughs> but this is pretty easy. Now, when you're doing incremental TDD, you're not going to solve every problem at once. You're just solving the problem that's in the test that you've written so far. So we're not going to do the parsing. We're not going to do the case insensitivity. We're just going to do the basic case, which in this case is we're going to look at the headers, and we're going to get the content type header, and we're going to say, does that equal the expected media type? And if it does, it works. And if it doesn't, it it's, uh, doesn't have the content type. And there we go, our test pass. Now, as usual, when you're doing incremental TDD, this is not good enough. So we need to write another test to take us the next step. Uh, but before I do that, I'm, I'm duplicating this code all over the case. Uh, all over the place. And particularly, I know from experience that when you're doing parsing code, uh, testing parsing code, you end up with a lot of different cases. So I want, what I want to do is I want to factor out the commonalities here into a simple little one-line check uh, um, function. So let's do that. We'll take this, which is our content type. We need to, so what we need to do is make the specific test here generic, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the content type out, I'm going to take the media type out. This is our expected media type. Looks like it's already there. We'll put that up here. And then we have the, what is this? This is going to be our, um, our expected result. So let's pull that out. Pull this up here. I think it's a little confusing to have this say expected media type, so I'm just going to call this media type. Okay. Now mm -hmm. I should be able to take this and pull it out into a function, which I'm going to call check. Okay. And then I can inline this and this and this. Okay, let's try doing something similar here. Here we're going to take application JSON, compare it to plain uh, text slash plain, and that's going to be expected to be false. Great. Now we've got a couple of one-line tests. Some people like having their tests split apart, but I, in cases like this, especially with parsing, I like to sort of munge them all together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a a message here. I'm going to say that it matches and it does not match. And I'll take the message through here so that when a test fails, I can see which one it is. And now I can put these both in the same test. Mm -hmm. Sort of a parameterized test, if you're familiar with those. Uh, Pellet says, uh, when you have multiple things you know you want to do, do you have tricks to make sure you don't forget a particular test? Is thinking through the types of tests you want first too much upfront work? Curious you know you know you've reached a good stopping point. Uh, that's a great question, Pellet. Uh, what I do is when I think of another additional tests, I just write them down. It uh, should be case insensitive. And then if you do it in Mocha, at least, if you don't put a body, it will mark it as skipped, and that's how I remember. Or in this case, I might do something like this. We've got case insensitivity, we've got white space, and we've got parameters. And uh, 
These, I, I want this episode to be less than an hour. We got 10 minutes left, so let's get through these. I don't think they're going to be that hard, though. Case insensitivity, we can take our application JSON and we'll say that application JSON and application JSON should still match, should ignore a case. Uh, Lazy Dev says, uh, I put in comments, should test X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes I'll write it down on a card. If I'm, if I'm working with a pairing partner, one of us will keep a little card, note card with notes on what to put next. Uh, there's a variety of ways of doing it, but yeah, you absolutely think of, think ahead through all the things you need if you want and make notes of them. It's just that as you work, you might discover that some of those ideas were wrong and just be willing to let them go. So there's our case insensitivity. Uh, that should fail because we're not doing it yet. Uh, we can implement it now. There turns out that there are some languages where case insensitivity is tricky, but I think for our function, for our uh, for our headers, our HTTP headers, they're mostly going to be in English. In fact, they may be restricted to ASCII for that matter. I'm not sure about that. So in that case, I should be able to just compare them case insens insensitivity by doing a two lower case on each one. Okay. Uh, now we need to do white space. Let's go ahead and grab this one again. And we'll say if we put a bunch of spaces around one and a couple of tabs around the other, that should still match, should ignore white space. It's going to fail. Easily fixed, we'll just trim these puppies. And Part of me would be happier if I put the trim first. Not really a good reason for that. It just feels right. And then finally parameters. So we're going to need to deal with the case when we can have any number of parameters on here. Oh, and we also should probably do parameters with white space. Uh, we could have a char set equals UTF-8, even though that's not necessary, but we could also have foo equals bar and, you know, anything else. So we should ignore parameters. That, of course, is not doing that, but this is pretty straightforward. They're all separated by semicolons, so we can just split this out into its component parts and then ignore everything that's after the first one. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take our content type, and I'm going to factor that out into a content type header. And then I'll take that and I'll split it on the semicolons, and that will give us the media type and a bunch of ignored parameters, which I'm going to call ignored parameters to make it excruciatingly obvious what's going on here. And then we can just compare the media type. Uh, you know, it occurs to me, we're doing all this dereferencing of the content type, but if the content type doesn't exist, that could be a problem. So let's... Uh, Let's deal with that. No content type header. Ah, Charlie Pancakes beat me to it. Uh, asks, uh, does it feel gracefully if there's no content type header? We should check that. Again, eating the onion from the inside out, you start with the happy path, then you do the special cases, and then I often do the uh, air cases towards the end. So there we go. Uh, that is passing. So I think we need to deal with the white space case. So let's check what happens if we've got some white case around our parameters. Uh, I think that should be just fine. Yes. And then the no content type header. Our check code here always puts a header in, so I'm just going to write a new test here. I'm going to say it uh, doesn't blow up if content, well, let's see, let's say handles missing content type header, or maybe still works when content type header doesn't exist. And I'll just grab all of this. And so we're not going to have a header, which means we don't need to pass it in here. We're going to check to see if we have application JSON. We're going to express the answer to be false. We don't need a message because this is the only assertion in this test. 
And I think that's going to throw an exception. Yeah, I cannot read property split of undefined. So we'll just come in here and we'll say if content type not equals or equals undefined, then we'll return false. Nice little guard clause. Uh, Pellet says, if it doesn't exist and you pass non-existent expected media type, should it return true? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. But because we have type checking on this, it's not possible to pass in an undefined media type. So I'm not gonna worry about that one. That would be a really weird use case. I, I think that would be bad design to support that, to be honest. Um, okay, so that's now working and I can't think any of any more edge cases. Uh, just double checking this. Our check is only used by this function. So I'm gonna put it down inside here. And now uh, we've implemented our leaf node, but now what we need to do is now we need to go back up because it's not, it's not hooked in yet. Now we need to go back up to our router and hook it up there. Now our router already has tests, so it should just be a matter of swapping out the implementation for the one that's more thorough. We don't need to add more tests around this because we've already tested it thoroughly in HTTP request. So. This should still work. And there we go. I am gonna check it manually. You always wanna check your, your code manually because uh, although uh, TDD is, does a really good job of making sure you program what you meant to, it doesn't check to see that you actually knew what you were doing. Uh, it can only check that you did what you thought you were, going, were supposed to. It's very good at that. Uh, but as we're gonna see next week, uh, that doesn't prevent all bugs. So now I should be able to see this work when I have application JSON. Uh, it would help if I ran the server. So it works when we have application JSON, yes. And it should also work when we have mixed case. And there we go, working, perfect. So that's it. Uh, now we can check in. I'll do that off camera. So that is how you add a feature cleanly. Uh, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> Uncle Scientist, works the first time. Yeah, generally speaking with test-driven development, works the first time every time, unless you misunderstood what you were supposed to do. And we'll talk about that next week. So that's how you add a feature cleanly. What we've done, first we understood the feature. We looked at the RFC, we understood the content type header. Uh, we skimmed the existing design to see sort of what the various behaviors were. We found the implementation, which was in the ROT13 router. And then we found the place that should have the responsibilities for what we're adding, what we're adding which turned out not to be the router, it turned out to be the request. So we decided how those two were gonna connect. They connected pretty easily. We decided what we we're gonna change, and then we we're gonna implement that change, starting with the leaf nodes, and working our way to the top. I'm gonna to take more questions and comments if, uh, if there are any uh, in, in a moment. Go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, before then though, a couple of announcements for you. Uh, first off, next week's Lunch and Learn is gonna be same time, Tuesday at noon Pacific. That's gonna be July 7th. And what we're gonna be looking at is how to fix a bug. So today was about how to add a feature. Next time, how to fix a bug. Uh, that should be a pretty interesting one. It's just like adding features. It's not quite as straightforward as it seems at first glance. And then I also want to remind you, if you liked what you saw today and you'd like to uh, have me come in and do some private training for you or other sorts of consulting, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com. Uh, when I do private training and consulting, it's always in your language, uh, your libraries, your frameworks. I often do it in your actual code base uh, because it's easier. It's easy to learn these things in, with toy problems, but harder to figure out how to apply them to real code. So by doing my training courses in your real code base, uh, it's a great way to learn. So again, uh, go ahead and send me an email, jshore at jameshore.com if you'd like to talk about what we can do together. I'm happy to talk to you. Okay, uh, let's see if there's any questions. Uh, Uncle Scientist, uh, thanks for the comment. Um, <laughs> Uncle Scientist, adding a no longer crashes feature, right? Uh, Pelletit says, uh, I just recently came across a VS Code extension called Code Tours that lets you highlight interesting portions of a code base. Was curious if you had experience with similar tools or thought it would be useful in addition to skimming code. Uh, one thing that uh, Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio both do is they 
they have this ability where you can click a file and it would just sort of pop it up in another pane. That's really handy when you're when you're exploring code. And of course, any modern IDE is going to give you the ability to follow references and dependencies, and that's nice as well. Uh, so that is definitely something that I'll use uh, when the tools allow it. But part of the trick for skimming code is not getting distracted by the details. Big code base, you want to sort of get a general sense of how it all fits together in an hour or two. Uh, and to do that, just looking at the files and maybe the major method names uh, can be really helpful. Uh, but that said, the code tour, your tool you're talking about does sound interesting. This is the first time I've heard of it. So uh, thank you very much for mentioning it. Uh, that looks like all of our questions. It's one o'clock, so that is our time. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for participating. Uncle Scientist, thanks for your comments. Uh, Pellet, uh, Charlie Pancakes, I appreciate your comments and questions as we are going. Um, next time, June 7th, Tuesday at noon. Uh, thanks once again, everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, you coming along, and I will see you next week.